welcome. My name is Julian Savalescu. I'm the uh, new Chen Sulan Centennial Chair in Medical Ethics and the Director of, of the Centre for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. Um, welcome to the inaugural Global Biomedical Ethics Lecture. Um, a special welcome to Kenneth Mark from the Ministry of Health and our own Dean Yapseng Chong. Um, the Centre for Biomedical Ethics was established by Professor Alastair Campbell in 2006. This lecture embodies his and my, my vision to become a leader in thinking about the most challenging bioethical issues of our time to do with human, geopolitical and planetary survival, such as the fair and just allocation of limited resources, benefits and burdens, as manifested through the pandemic, antimicrobial resistance and climate change. And also the evolution of the human species through life extension, human enhancement, space exploration. We also aim to be the leading centre in biomedical ethics in Asia, understanding Asian thinking, philosophies and culture, and how these influence the ethical considerations for the fastest growing economies in the 21st century. And thirdly, we aim to be a leading centre for leveraging the power uh, of technology and data ethically and efficiently into research, practice and people's lives, weighing risk to privacy against the utility to health and wellbeing. I'm deeply grateful for the support of the Chen Su Lan Trust, the Dean, Yap Seng Chong and the Provost Tech Hua. I just want to say a couple of minutes about the significance of Professor Emmanuel's lecture. In 10 years ago, uh, 10 years ago I wrote a book uh, in 2012 called Unfit for the Future, the urgent need for human enhancement, human moral enhancement. And the central thesis of that book was this century we face a number of existential threats to humanity, not only climate change, um, but um, biological war or biological terrorism, um, natural biological events, as we've just seen, nuclear war, uh, as we risk now in the Ukraine, um, runaway artificial technology, artificial intelligence, and a number of other threats. And the central, fe central feature of these threats is that, first of all, we have the technological means to ameliorate them or to prevent them. But then in many cases, such as biological war or terrorism, nuclear war, they're the result of our use of technology. And that this is a century in which our fate is genuinely in our hands. The greatest challenges we face now are not scientific, but are ethical, as we've seen in preventing and dealing with the pandemic. Part of the book was that we also need to advance human moral development. One of the hardest questions of the pandemic and bioethics itself is how to allocate limited health resources, how, how to allocate life-saving and life-risking interventions. This raises questions about the value of life and it's present in the allocation of PPE, hospital beds, ventilators, ECMO, bypass, vaccines and other life-saving interventions. There are a number of solutions that seem easy and alluring but just don't work. One is to wish it away or argue we can just spend more money. Governor Cuomo from New York stated we can't put a price on life, which is manifestly nonsense. Every resource is limited. Uh, inevitably, we run up against a wall and have to make ethical decisions. Another solution that doesn't work is just to claim that science alone can solve these problems. We're just following the science. Science can tell us how to achieve something, but it can't tell us what we should achieve. That's an ethical question. And lastly, appeal to motherhood statements like, we're all in this together, a statement that Zeke and I both find unhelpful. Benefits and burdens are to be distributed. Some people do better and some people will do worse. These are deep ethical questions, not scientific questions. In 1977, John Torek, a philosopher, wrote a paper called Should the Numbers Count? He asks us to imagine this kind of dilemma it's a version of the dilemma he presented. You're the Coast Guard and a, and a boat has been overturned 
and a storm is brewing and there are a number of people in different life rafts. To the north is a single individual in a life raft and to the south are five individuals in another life raft. And you only have time to go in one direction before the storm hits and will likely drown the um, occupants of the life raft. Do you go north and save one, or do you go south and save five? Um, <clears throat> we've surveyed ordinary people, and around 99% of people say you should go south and save the five. We should save more lives rather than fewer. This is a very strong intuition that people have and is supported by ethical theories such as utilitarianism and contractualism. If you accept this idea, then we should save people with a higher probability of survival or people who will use life-saving resources that are limited for shorter periods of time. We should roll out vaccines in the COVID pandemic sequentially to the oldest age groups first and, and sequentially to younger age groups. When allocating life-saving resources in the pandemic, we should prefer, um, such as ventilators, we should prefer younger people, those with fewer coexisting morbidities, people without disabilities, women, um, and not people from ethnic minorities, because those people have lower chances of surviving. So one view is we should save the greatest number, which I'm sure Zeke will, will address. But Torek's own view was that this doesn't show equal concern and respect for each person's claim. What does it matter to me if somebody else's chance of surviving is 40% if my chance is 30%? However, a system that aims to save greater numbers will save, preferentially, people with a higher probability of survival. Torek argued that equality requires tossing a coin between going north and going south, because that gives everyone an equal chance of having what matters to them saved, their life. John Harris des described this as giving each person the best chance of the longest, best quality of life for him or her. So equality and utility are often radically in tension. And these are not questions that there are simple answers to. Indeed, during the pandemic and the allocation of life-sustaining resources, other factors besides equality have been seen to matter, such as responsibility, the existence of dependence, uh, the existence of, of social responsibilities and quality of life. There's no better person to address these topics than Professor Ezekiel Emanuel. He's the Vice Provost of Global Initiatives and the Diane V.S. Levy and Robert M. Levy University Professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He's an oncologist and world leader in health policy and bioethics. He's a special advisor to the Director General of the World Health Organization, Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress and member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He was the founding chair of the Department of Bioethics at the NIH and held that position until 2011. From 2009 to 11, he served as Special Advisor on Health Policy to the Director of the Office of Management and Budget and National Economic Council. In this role, he was instrumental in drafting the Affordable Care Act under President Obama. Uh, he's also served on the Biden-Harris Transition COVID Advisory Board. He's the most widely cited bioethicist in history he has over 350 publications and has edited or authored 15 books, two of which are Which Country Has the World's Best Healthcare? And I know he's a, a great fan of the Singaporean healthcare system. And the, one of them, I, I, I love the topic, it's um, Re Reinventing American Healthcare, How the Affordable Care Act Will Improve Our Terribly Complex, Blatantly Unjust, Outrageously Expensive, Grossly Inefficient, Error-Prone System. Um, I'm amazed he managed to get that past the, uh, the, uh, the publishers. Just as a personal note, I started my PhD in 1990 uh, at the Centre for Human Bioethics at Monash University, and my topic was justice and healthcare allocation. And after one year of working on this topic, I threw in the bin all of my notes and completely changed topic uh, to end-of-life decision-making because I, I thought I could make no useful contribution to this debate. So I'm personally very interested to hear, after 32 years, what the answers to these debates are. Uh, so welcome, uh, Zeke Emanuel. He will talk on what is the fair and equitable allocation of scarce medical resources. <laughs> 
Thank you, Julian, for that lovely introduction. And uh, I think round about 1990 also, uh, I had confronted how difficult the problem of allocation was and yet how important it was. Um, but like you, I put it aside for about uh, 15 years and then uh, uh, the US government issued a report on the allocation of H1N1 resources anticipating a pandemic in flu. And uh, uh, I knew that they were wrong. Uh, I said it publicly that they were wrong. And I wrote my first paper on allocation in science uh, showing that I thought definitively they were wrong. Um, and have been working and thinking about the topic ever since. And I agree with you, it's probably the hardest topic in uh, my opinion in uh, biomedical ethics, which is the first point I wanna make. Um, COVID made clear uh, that there's a central role for ethics in uh, public policy challenges. Um, and if you look at the pandemic, most of the most serious and uh, difficult questions were precisely ethical questions. Who should be prioritized for vaccinations, as Julian mentioned, PPE, respirators, and many other things. Mandates for masking and vaccination, are they ethical? How should they be structured to be ethical? Uh, are immune certificates ethical? Under what circumstances could they be ethical? Uh, do they discriminate against groups? Uh, how do we decide which uh, hospitals get ventilator shipments when we have a limited supply. And then uh, similarly challenge studies. We have a vaccine. We want to get the vaccine out. We want to prove whether it works or not. Our challenge studies with a potentially deadly vaccine, ethical or not. All of these were hotly debated uh, beginning in 2020. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think most of them have a resolution uh, um, and I'm at least going to talk about the prioritization of vaccines. Now, historically, bioethics has been very successful, I think, at considering protections of individual rights. Uh, we're all familiar with informed consent and with uh, uh, review boards for research studies. Um, but I don't think they've been equally concerned or successful with allocation of resources. And I think much like Julian and I, a lot of people in the history of bioethics have just found them too hard and moved on rather than banging their head against a wall. Um, uh, but I don't think we, can, we could do that. And um, as I said, I got to this because of uh, pronouncements, policies that were being propagated regarding allocation of things like vaccines uh, or uh, flu uh, medications during a pandemic by the US government. If you actually look, not over the past 75 years actually is the wrong uh, uh, timeline. Uh, literally 100 years ago, uh, insulin was just discovered in Toronto, Canada. Uh, Banting and Best had uh, uh, been able to isolate it and show that it could bring down glucose levels but it was in tremendously short supply. They had very great difficulty in uh, actually manufacturing it and allocation had to be done. Um, uh, uh, Banting did it uh, and he did it quite unethically and quite poorly. Um, about uh, uh, 25 years later, during World War II, penicillin, which had been discovered in 1929, uh, but could not be manufactured in large quantities. The United States government threw lots of money because of the war effort to try to manufacture it, uh, as well as the British government, and then researchers in Oxford were able to actually manufacture it, but it was still in limited supply, could not treat everyone, um, and so there were major choices about who should get it uh, in 1943 when finally had sufficient quantity to allocate, and uh, Winston Churchill made uh, the decision that uh, it would go to um, soldiers with uh, gonorrheal, uh, and, uh, gonorrhea and syphilis uh, so they could get back to the front and not soldiers who were wounded and very little should go to the public. And this also was, uh, when it was discovered, uh, controversial. The 1960s brought uh, dialysis, uh, chronic hemodialysis, and again, the dialysis machines were in short supply. It was very expensive. Allocations decisions had to be made. And of course, every society, including in Singapore, has to make very significant decisions about the allocation of organs for transplantation. It's both 
the pandemic and then subsequently organs for transplantation that brought me to look at the topic. When we look at vaccines during 2020, uh, policymakers, and I use that term broadly, that includes presidents of countries, prime ministers, uh, all called for a fair and equitable allocation. You saw this phrase in every venue you can imagine. Uh, there was an uh, op-ed written in uh, the Washington Post that was authored by uh, um, the Premier of New Zealand and Canada and a few other countries calling for the fair and equitable allocation. Um, but if you ask, well, what would constitute a fair and equitable uh, allocation, none of them had any substance to it. They could utter the phrase, but it was totally vacuous uh, as to what would constitute fair and equitable. Um, and it was uh, frustrating. The implication was, of course, we should send quantities of vaccines to low and middle income countries, um, but no one could say, well, how much would be a fair and equitable allocation to low and middle income middle income countries, and without being able to say something substantive or a principle, uh, it turned out that that phrase was uh, vacuous. Uh, that, among other things, brought me to try to elucidate this issue. COVID also, unlike many other previous allocation issues, uh, brought uh, a major test for actually moving from theory uh, to practice to find out how well we could actually implement our theoretical insights as to what the priority could, should be. I mean, if we could say who should get prioritized, how good were we at actually following through? Um, so what I'm gonna do now is try to distill the lessons we have from COVID for allocation and then apply them to a, a few other uh, cases. Now, the ethical allocation of medical resources is a three-step process. First, you have to elucidate the fundamental underlying principles, and you have to organize them into a coherent ethical framework for allocation. Um, and that process, I think, is uh, the starting point. And I want to argue through this that we actually have a solution to that problem. That was what befuddled me in 1990 as it befuddled Julian, but I think we've now advanced and made progress uh, that Julian so much wanted. The second is you have to use those values and that framework that you develop to prioritize groups for getting the scarce resource. And third, you actually have to implement that priority list and realize the fundamental ethical values that you've articulated with fidelity and try to counter problems that you end up seeing with the actual implementation, which might lead you to adjust your priority tiers. Um, in the midst of this pandemic, in 2020 largely, you had a lot of reports all over the world uh, recommend, making recommendations about what ethical values are important, what priority tiers are important, uh, you had in the United States the National Academies, the CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Policy, uh, lots of state and local governments not always uh, necessarily agreeing. You had plenty of international countries. You've got reports from Norway and Australia and New Zealand. Almost every country you can imagine had a policy and uh, issued a report on this. Um, you also had independent organizations like Nuffield Council in England issuing, uh, and then you had independent scholars uh, uh, writing about this. I'm actually going to argue it's very interesting, but we had a convergence and a, I would say argue worldwide consensus um, on similar substantive values and a lot of similar procedural principles, and we ultimately came to similar, although not identical, in the differences we could discuss for a long time, uh, priority groups for allocating the resources. And we learned a lot about how to do that with fidelity and how not to do it, uh, um, primarily in the United States. So this is probably, as we say in uh, um, the United States, this is the money slide. It's all here, and I don't have to say much more. Um, there are, I would argue, four fundamental, eth I get, cameras down, um, four fundamental ethical values, uh, utility, priority, equality, and social contribution. And I think they're 
some of them we understand, and some of them we've had to understand a little different, differently. Now, utility is, you know, we should have the most impact in terms of promoting benefits and minimizing uh, harms. Priority is we shouldn't exacerbate the disparities and vulnerabilities of those who are worst off, uh, whether we're going to decide worst off by income, health status, geography, or other criteria. Equality is don't discriminate in the allocation based on irrelevant factors like religion, race, ethnicity, or gender. Um, but you can consider health needs, age, risk, other factors to be relevant in your allocation. Um, and then there's this social contribution value, uh, which is your allocation should recognize or reward social contribution. Sometimes that's social contribution in the past, so that's called reciprocity. Sometimes, or more frequently, I would argue in public health emergencies, it's social contribution that will arise uh, so it's future oriented. So in essence, my argument here is you've got five ethical values under four different headings. Let's just explore these a little more. Uh, across almost every co uh, COVID guidance document, uh, the fundamental values were the same. Um, one of the things that when you outline five values uh, becomes obvious is no single value trumps all of them, and a plausible allocation framework has to be a multi-value system that combines the different values and prioritizes which are going to be important uh, at what stage. Maximizing ben benefits and preventing harms. Now, one of the important points is appealing to medical need is totally uninformative in this case, right? All people, for example, needed the COVID vaccine, so saying people who are medical need should get it first is totally unhelpful. I just want to tell you a little side story here, parenthetical, not to leave this room. Uh, when I was at OMB, and uh, I, in, uh, very soon after I arrived there, I published a major article in The Lancet about allocating resources for organ transplantation, which I advocated that younger people should get priority um, and that older people should get lower priority. I was pilloried by um, uh, uh, many Republicans, including on the floor of the House of Representatives by one uh, representative from uh, uh, Michelle Bachman for uh, uh, Minnesota. And the uh, former vice presidential candidate, Sarah Palin, went after me as well. And uh, uh, I, asked the, I told the journalist, I said, just ask her how she would allocate a scarce resources like organs because we can't take care of everyone. Uh, I was in the room. He asked her that question. She hung up the phone. <laughs> she called back very quickly and said, oh, we should allocate by medical need. And I told the journalist, that's about the dumbest answer I could imagine um, because it doesn't solve your problem. All the people who want organs, they need them. Otherwise, they'll die. Um, so the issue is who needs them more and should get priority, not who needs them. Um, typically in healthcare, when we think about benefits and risks, we focus primarily on mortality and quality of life. Um, increasingly, we are thinking about some financial considerations like cost sharing, financial burdens, um, and taking account of those. But should we broaden out our view of benefits and harms to include other things like what if you know, medical treatment enhances your education or attainment? What if it does more to empower women rather than a different set of uh, benefits? Should empowering women count? Should reducing poverty count? Um, we have traditionally, at least in healthcare, not included these, but I'm not sure that is the right answer. I'm pretty sure it's the wrong answer. Um, we also need to be concerned with near-term harms as well as long-term harms. So in allocation a resource, you need to be concerned about reducing hospitalization, reducing mortality, but you also need to be concerned about potentially reducing long COVID or other disabilities that might result uh, from the uh, allocation. And you should be concerned about direct harms, such as hospitalization and death from COVID, but indirect harms count also. 
because as we have seen with COVID, you can stretch a healthcare system and get excess deaths that have nothing to do with COVID, but more people dying from other conditions because they're not getting medical care. So all of these considerations when we are trying to maximize benefits and reduce harms need to be taken into account. And they're not always thought through. This is where I think a lot of the reports have fallen short because they haven't recognized near term and long term and they haven't recognized uh, uh, direct and indirect uh, harms. Mitigating disadvantage is important. Allocating resources should avoid exacerbating existing disparities and in inequities in healthcare. There are many dimensions of disadvantage, ill health, poverty, exclusion from opportunities, and they can result from a variety of prejudices or problems. Um, mitigating inequities could also maximize benefits and minimize harms because often the people who have uh, uh, been discriminated against or have been on the short end of the stick, as we say, are ones who are at very high risk of getting adverse health outcomes. But not every characteristic associated with increased harm is a result of unjust disadvantage. Let me give you a very concrete example. Being male is related to higher direct harms and near-term harms from COVID. Men do worse than women on mortality from COVID. Men do worse in terms of antibody response to vaccines, and their antibodies wane much more rapidly from a vaccine. But I would argue that being male is typically not an unjust disadvantage, right? It's typically in most societies an advantage. And so saying we're gonna mitigate disadvantage is not the justification you use for prioritizing men, on the other hand, you might prioritize men because they suffer worse harms. Equal moral concern. This is, I would say, one of the most confused principles. Uh, people often say, well, you've got to have equality. But if you're going to e give equal moral concern, which is the right phrasing of equality, uh, it usually means you're going to treat people differently because people are not similarly situated, especially in a public health emergency. Um, and you should not take irrelevant factors into account, but you can take relevant factors, and relevant factors almost inevitably mean people will be treated differently. So paradoxically, equal moral concern typically requires differential treatment, not equal treatment of everyone. For example, in COVID, people at higher risk should be prioritized for a vaccine or other intervention. Um, that doesn't mean you spread the peanut butter evenly or you spread the vaccines evenly. It means you look to who is at higher risk. Treating people equally when people are differently situated often produces more harm, and that is a reason that you have to treat people differentially. So if you treat someone in an area with high COVID cases or high hospitalizations and death equally to a person located in a country or a region with low COVID uh, cases or deaths, I think you are not showing equal moral concern. You're actually violating this principle, even though it might superficially look like you are treating people equally. Reciprocity. Reciprocity is the preferential allocation of medical resources towards those people who have helped reduce the scarcity in the past with the goal of incentivizing reducing scarcity in the future. The, the simplest case is to think of reciprocity in the context of organ donation. There are some countries where people who pledge to donate their kidneys uh, 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 after they die for transplantation actually receive higher priority if their kidneys fail and they need a transplant. That is a symbol of reciprocity. I don't know about Singapore. I'll give you a non-healthcare example that we have in the United States quite frequently. Um, if people are applying for a job, one of the priorities that is given is to veterans of the military. That is reciprocity. We're appreciating you serve the country and going to give you priority for a job. Now, you may not agree with that, but that is the notion of reciprocity. Um, it's generally, as I've argued, used to differentiate among similar recipients rather than 
to override other values. In other words, reciprocity is typically should be a lower consideration compared to others of these values, and I'll give you an example a little later about that. And finally, there's instrumental value, and this prioritizes the allocation that indirectly increases the realization of other values in the future. So we prioritize healthcare workers for an intervention because not that they're special people and they deserve special treatment, although we do. Um, yes, that was a joke. Um, don't take me seriously all the time. Uh, but we prioritize healthcare workers because they will go on to save other people and uh, um, cumulatively minimizing harms and maximizing benefits. So that's the justification for instrumental value going forward. Now, in the discussion around COVID, it was very easy for people, especially heads of government, heads of uh, international health organizations, to, when they were asked about fair and equitable allocation, or asked about allocation in general, they frequently fell back on citing what are procedural principles, not the substantive principles I've just mentioned. Um, procedural principles are not, do not determine allocation. They just don't. They tell you how to maybe discuss them, how to specify them after you've d delineated them, how to rank them, but they actually don't, aren't substantive values. They're easily invoked, and I'll give you them, but they shouldn't be confused with substantive principles at all. And we rely too much, I think, in general, in allocation on procedural principles because we find the substantive principles too hard to think about. What are the procedural principles? You all know them. They're transparency. The allocation framework ought to be publicly available and publicly justified not made behind closed doors and no one talking about them. They, there should be engagement. The affected public should have an opportunity to assess, comment on the proposed values and allocation. That doesn't mean the community gets to decide. It does mean that they have a right to be engaged. And then whatever principles you have should be evidence responsive. As the evidence changes, the principles might have to be modified, or interpretation and application of the principles might have to be modified. But again, all of these are important, but they're not the substantive allocation principles, and you can't get to substantive allocation principles simply by invoking these three and talking about transparency and engagement with the community and all of these good virtues and values, but they don't solve the fundamental problem. Again. I want to suggest that there was a lot of agreement once the fundamental values were articulated and how they should be prioritized and how the priority tiers came. In general, across the globe, and again, I think there was worldwide consensus here. Uh, that doesn't mean unanimity. It does mean uh, broad, broad agreement. Um, that instrumental value and maximizing benefits and minimizing harms were the two predominant principles and everything else was subsequent, although not irrelevant. Um, uh, but these delineated the top uh, tiers. If you look, for example, at Ontario, in phase one, they prioritize people in congregate living for seniors, healthcare workers, that's the instrumental value, adults in First Nations, here you have introduced very early on, much earlier than in other countries, the notion of uh, the disparities and prioritizing people who've had unjust uh, disparities or inequities. Adults with chronic home care, who are chronic home care recipients and adults over age 80. Basically a lot of people at high risk, so you're gonna minimize the harms that they get, healthcare workers so that they can help minimize those harms, and in this case, minimizing disparities. United Kingdom was, you know, in some ways the simplest of all. Uh, you take people, you begin going down just from the oldest people down progressively. Um, I think there are lots of problems with that, and we'll get to one problem uh, uh, in a little bit uh, uh, just to presage that problem. You know, if you have different, uh, say, racial groups in a country that have different lifespans going down by age will prioritize those people who live the longest and uh, undercut your uh, typically minorities who uh, live shorter lives. The difference between blacks and whites in the United States is now about five years. And if you say had a cutoff at 75, which we did in the United States, 
turns out whites' average lifespan is above 75, but the blacks is below 75, and so you would be uh, compounding uh, the inequities uh, of African Americans. Norway uh, was much more vague, I would say. Um, uh, so they had a phase one. Those people were at risk factors for severe illness and death, then health workers, and then workers with cr critical societal functions like delivering food, uh, keeping the electricity going. Australia had um, quarantine and border workers, frontline healthcare workers, so you can see, again, the instrumental value uh, uh, being top, and then and aged care and disability care staff, again, instrumental value, um, and then finally the residents to minimize harm. So, I, I, as I said, not uniformity, but um, uh, a lot of consensus here. I would note that there were other characteristics associated with higher risk, and if you wanted to minimize uh, uh, harms and maximize benefits, you probably should have taken into account Elderly and vulnerable adults living in community housing were not always taken into account, even though they were at higher risk. And people in prison were frequently not prioritized, even though they had much higher risk because of the crowded living conditions. Um, interestingly, in the United States, the National Academies, in their report on how to allocate vaccines, um, noted that men and individuals from racial minority communities are at higher risk, but when they proposed their allocation scheme, basically ignored what they had just said. And they didn't actually address the issue. I, I commented on this, and they didn't take the comment uh, uh, and respond to it. Um, the third point, the third step in an ethical allocation, as I mentioned, is going from theory to practice. And we learned a lot about the problems of going from theory to practice. Let me just say one fundamental and big problem is human nature and the selfishness of people um, and the willingness of people to be unethical to prioritize themselves, i.e. lie about their age, lie about their condition, uh, cut in line, go to different places to get priority. Um, we had, there are many problems. One was distributing vaccines to countries or in the United States to states based upon population. I would argue and will argue that it violates these rules. Overbroad and under-inclusive priority tiers, uh, healthcare workers, turns out that's the wrong group. Uh, rigid age cutoffs, like in England for reasons that I mentioned, exacerbating disparities. A passive allocation process telling people that vaccine or whatever is available and they have to go and get it versus active reaching out to people. Uh, and then rigidly excluding people not in a priority tier, which leads almost guaranteed to wastage. Um, so I want you to take home the message. A good priority uh, framework, a good allocation framework, isn't just good at the theory. It also has to be good in real life. Um, equal moral concern appears to suggest distributing vaccines equally among countries based upon population. This was the view of COVAX. We should allocate equally among countries to reach 3% of the population, then 20% of the population, and then we should take into account how much COVID they've had. Uh, this violates uh, the fact that countries have differential number of COVID cases, and deaths among countries are going to be very, very different. If minimizing harm is to take priority, and equal moral concern means treating those with highest risk more uh, as more important, then distributing vaccines among countries should not reflect population, but it should reflect COVID risk. And this has very practical uh, consequences. In the United States, we distributed vaccines. Uh, President Trump argued that we should distribute vaccines to states based upon, uh, based upon population. And so we distributed among our 50 states purely on population, and COVAX did the same thing with uh, its vaccine. I think this is widely recognized now to be wrong and unethical uh, way of doing it. And the best justification that the WHO could come up with to defend the population-based allocation was um, political. That's not an ethical justification, but you know we can't get countries to support this unless they get some vaccine. And let me just say, one of the consequences of this, if you peel back how the allocations were made, um, were 
middle-income countries that were heavily hit by COVID, Peru being at the top of the list, were treated unjustly and did not get their fair share of vaccine. Other countries, particularly in Africa, who were not hit at all, they got vaccine even though it, much of it ended up not being taken up because there just weren't that many cases and people were not convinced they should get a vaccine. Passive versus active sign-up. In the United States, we relied upon people waiting in line or signing up through the internet to get a vaccine. These distribution make mechanisms clearly are biased and reiterate disparities. So who can so wait in line, have the time to wait in line or sign up on the internet? People who have spare time, uh, who have broadband internet access, who have good computer skills, English speakers, or they have easy transportation to wherever the line is and have the time to wait in line. They put poor, elderly, people who can't get out of their houses, non-English speakers, uh, people who can't afford transportation, at a serious disadvantage. Britain did better in this regard. Uh, they identified their priority tiers um, and they were much more active. So people in high-risk groups by age or with comorbidities get in their medical records, they received a text inviting them to book their vaccinations and a follow-up call if they hadn't booked their vaccination appointments. This is active outreach, much better than passive outreach. We missed the opportunity to text or call or go door to door to give people vaccines. To do that, the United States would have had to have had a better healthcare system, a better data collection system, um, uh, and know who those people were by age and, and uh, comorbidities. Um, allocating to multiple tiers at once. Um, we shouldn't be too rigid in adhering to our allocation tiers. Let me give you two examples. In Massachusetts, they said people working at healthcare facilities should be prioritized and then go to people at risk based upon age and health status, like being immunocompromised. The consequence is you had postdocs in laboratory facilities working at big, large hospitals like the Mass General getting vaccinated when old people couldn't get a vaccine. Stupid, right? Just plainly stupid. In New York, you had a similar situation where they allocated vaccines. Places were penalized if they didn't use up their vaccines, but they were told they need to stick rigidly to, the, uh, um, to their groups, and they couldn't go to the next tier without getting people in the first tier. And the consequence is that a lot of vaccine expired in the refrigerator because they couldn't get it to people who were at risk. You can have a lot of inefficiency if you are too rigid about your tiers. Um, so there are lots of mechanisms we can do, but here I just mention that we have lots of learnings. Population-based allocation, unethical, wrong, we should not use it. Um, we should have allocation based upon multi-principled, uh, multi-valued uh, ethical framework. No single value is going to rule. Distributing interventions to priority tiers needs to be more active and less passive, and it shouldn't be done by rigid order uh, tiers. You should do multiple tiers at once. Now, given that, I think this is what we learned from COVID and that there's a widespread, as I mentioned, worldwide agreement on the values, the ethical framework, mostly the priority tiers, although there is some variation and we can discuss why that is and I think why it's somewhat legitimate. What can we say about some of these other allocations? And one of the areas that came up while we were discussing COVID turns out to be malaria vaccines. Myself and Owen uh, uh, Schaefer, who was uh, uh, with me at uh, working uh, on some WHO work, um, heard this presentation from WHO officials who were trying to allocate the malaria vaccine. We have about uh, 627,000 malaria deaths in 2020. Most of these are in Africa, and most of these are in children under five years of age. Uh, there was research done on a vaccine over many, many years. Um, in the end, uh, Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi participated in a phase three and a phase four a randomized trial to test whether the GSK malaria vaccine would reduce severe malaria in kids. Um, they're part of a pilot program to actually test out the implementation, see how well it works. 
Um, it has modest efficacy for children under five. You need four doses to prevent less than 50% of severe malaria cases for kids between one and four. Um, but the WHO backed the vaccine um, and called for its widespread use in sub-Saharan Africa. There are more than 30 African countries that have moderate to high uh, malaria transmission rates. Uh, the malaria vaccine, it's estimated, could benefit more than 25 million children per year. Um, but that would require 100 million vaccine doses because it's four doses per child. For the foreseeable future, the next four to six years, this vaccine will be in short supply. We will not have 100 million vaccines produced to distribute to the countries. And you can see from this chart um, uh, that you're just going to have demand far outstripping supply for the next uh, four to six years, and maybe in some areas even longer term. So who gets it among those 30 countries? We were called and, uh, 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 that the uh, WHO wanted to prioritize the three countries, Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi, that participated in phase three and phase four uh, uh, trials to get top consideration uh, for that. And on that call, I remember Owen very much saying, well, you know, reciprocity is a principle. There's no doubt about it but it should be a lower principle. It can't be your primary distribution and there's something wrong about your prioritization. In part, you might also ask, what about the other countries that participated in the phase three? There was Burkina Faso and Gabon and Mozambique and Tanzania. Shouldn't they be considered too? Because they were critical to the proving it worked. Um, there's also an important question of how to weigh um, at-risk populations that they didn't do the study on. You know, pregnant women are at very high risk, higher risk than one to four-year-olds. Um, shouldn't they be, have been considered in the trial when you're thinking about how to allocate? From this, I'm not going to tell you how we should allocate malaria vaccine. One of the things I can say, though, is that the initial gut reaction of the policy makers to who are going to distribute it, that reciprocity ought to be the primary ethical consideration, was wrong. And I think they ended up being convinced by arguments we made that it was wrong. Um, so uh, you should use reciprocity only to break ties. Um, and a more important principle is we should value minimizing harm and maximizing the uh, life uh, saved of, the number of lives saved of children. And therefore, countries with worse burden should be prioritized. You can think about the monkeypox or mpox uh, case. Uh, that's now largely passed, and we can discuss why, but a lot of cases uh, in countries that M where MPOX is not uh, endemic, the United States being uh, the hardest hit, but by no means the only ones. Even within countries, this is a list of states in the United States, wide variation in the number of cases that have been reported. Um, on the other hand, MPOX is endemic in 11 African countries. In those countries, there are roughly 300 million people under age 40 who didn't get smallpox and aren't uh, vaccinated and aren't protected against MPOX. Uh, you can see the countries listed there that are at the top of the list. And across non-endemic countries like the United States, uh, uh, Britain, and Europe, uh, there are about 375 million people who uh, are under 40 and also didn't get smallpox vaccination. That includes almost 20 million men who have sex with men who were at high risk for MPOX. Um, turns out that there aren't that many smallpox vaccinations available to distribute worldwide. Um, the United States has distributed around a million doses, which aren't enough for all the men who have sex with men in the United States. It turns out to be quite hard in MPOX to think about how you prioritize. If preventing harm is your goal, well, does that mean reduce the risk of infection, reduce the risk of someone infecting others and spreading MPOX? Does it mean reducing the risk of complications, maybe even death from MPOX? It gets you to very different groups. Reduce risk of infection, that's men who have sex with men, and maybe people who work in laboratories handling MPOX. Reducing the risk of infecting others are people who live in congregate settings, people who have multiple sex partners, 
and then reduce risk of complications, you get the immune compromised in that group, uh, which aren't necessarily overlapping with the other group. If you're going to mi mitigate past inequities, who has been subject to undue disadvantage? Well, many people who are stigmatized and burdened because they have HIV, people who are in poverty, and people who are subject to racism or homophobia, uh, they are uh, people who've had past inequities, but also at increased risk to get MPOX or complications. And then instrumental value, the ability to protect others in the future, you know, you might, again, think of lab workers or people who, care, who give care, say, to children uh, or to uh, the elderly. Um, again, you could use the five values we've delineated as a framework to prevent death and illness, reduce association between death and unjust disadvantages, prioritize those who prevent harm and mitigate disparities, recognizing contributions in combating outbreaks of MPOX, and you want to treat similar individuals similarly. Um, you can come up with a set of priority tiers, reduce the risk of infection, reduce severe outcomes, people who belong to socially disadvantaged groups, uh, et cetera. And then you can produce tiers like this. Almost inevitably, in a situation like MPOX where we had just a few million doses, you are not going to get out of tier one. Um, and you probably, as I mentioned, should not rigidly adhere to each top tier, confirmed exposure to MPOX, et cetera, uh, because uh, you may find that some of the very, very precious vac vaccine is going to be wasted. It turns out vaccines played some role in the reduction of MPOX and the fact that we're not really worried about it now. But by and large, those core public health measures uh, uh, that we suggest, you know, avoid contact uh, for uh, men who have sex with men, reduce your number of sexual partners, um, uh, or eliminate them, that actually made a difference. And itself, this is the United States Daily MPOX report probably took care of it without much impact. Some impact, but not much impact of the vaccine. Let me conclude with cholera. Um, we've had an explosion of cholera, uh, um, uh, and we've had a vaccine approved, uh, millions of doses uh, stockpiled. Um, we've had an increase in cho cholera. Over 30 countries reported outbreaks in 2022, 50% more countries than before, places like Pakistan and Ethiopia, uh, Malawi, Syria, Cameroon, Somalia. Haiti had its first outbreak since 2019, and Lebanon, first outbreak since 1993. This is a real serious problem. It hasn't gotten nearly enough attention uh, in the world. Um, we have stockpiles, about 36 million doses of the vaccine. Uh, full protection requires two doses, given, given two weeks apart, um, and that protects you probably for three years. Uh, so if you have 36 million doses, you can cover 18 million people. How do you allocate among countries? So this is actually what the shipments are. Uh, uh, among countries, no country's gotten as many doses as they would want, uh, but we can discuss uh, how you should do it. I think the right allocation is cholera burden. How prevalent is cholera in your country, and how much do you have other mitigating rehydration therapies uh, and the like? Um, it turns out that situation is actually even worse than you might expect because uh, Sanofi. In India, manufactures 10% of the supply, but was planning to stop. Uh, fortunately, South Korea could bring up its uh, production, um, and uh, BioVac in South Africa is, setting, is planning to set up facilities, although it's not clear how fast they're going to get online and approved. Um, so they're trying to maximize supply, which is a very good approach by lengthening the gap, not two weeks, but go to one year. Um, it's unclear how well that will work, um, and we should be clear that unless we rapidly increase the amount of vaccine we're going to produce over that year, you're simply postponing the problem. You're not solving the problem. 
Um, and we could talk about postponement of, of the problem. Many allocations, for example, of organs, simply postpone the shortage and do not actually address prioritization. Who is going to do badly from cholera? Well, people who have low stomach acid for a variety of reasons, uh, taking uh, H2 blockers, children, older adults. Certain blood types do poorly. Chronic medical conditions do poorly and especially those who have lack of access to rehydration, clean water, uh, they uh, are at increased risk. Um, consider Haiti. This is the number of suspected cases uh, over uh, just three months uh, in Haiti. Um, they've got about 12 million people. Uh, the cholera has been resurgent. Um, and uh, they've had a number of cases, and you can see where the cases are worse. That, you know, sort of alligator mouth is uh, right around Port-au-Prince, the capital. Um, they've received shipment of cholera vaccine, uh, 1.17 million doses, um, and they're targeting those people over age one in areas that reported the most cholera cases. I think this is clearly the right answer. You allocate the people who are at highest risk where there's the most outbreak and the people who are at most at risk. And you can see from this chart, it's young kids between one and nine who are at highest risk of getting uh, uh, cholera. Uh, they don't have any immunity, uh, they haven't been exposed, they haven't had the vaccine, and they can be malnourished. Um, so it's gonna target, the, the, the plan in Haiti has been to target the population over age one in areas with high COVID. I think that's very much a defensible position, suggesting we might have learned something from COVID. I'm just going to conclude by um, uh, one of the things I think we've learned from COVID is that ethics has to be at the table from the start. Too often, administrators, policymakers, politicians think they need to start from scratch when confronted by ethical challenges of a medical resource shortage or a global health emergency. We have, I would argue, well-developed ethical frameworks for addressing allocation of scarce medical resources um, informed by the president, like COVID. Um, they exist. That's why we could come to a consensus. But we came to a consensus slowly because we started ab initio, and many of the organizations and countries did not have ethicists helping them. We need to build on this existing knowledge and not start like there's no knowledge. There, we don't have experts. Just as decision makers expect evidence-informed policies, they need ethics-informed policies. And so I would argue ethics needs to be integrated into the emergency response decision-making right from the start. Indeed, before the start, as we begin today to plan for how we're going to respond to future pandemics, the ethicists need to be there because we need to create frameworks that are readily available don't need lots of modification. They will, of course, need some modification. Who's at highest risk? Where are they located? Um, how do we prevent selfishness from intruding? So let me just say, substantive values to guide allocation of resources, I would argue, are settled. We have five of them. We've prioritized them. We know which in the ethical framework are to receive the most and which are to receive the least weight. We have to focus on those multi-value frameworks in different contexts, and we need to ensure that we actually implement these with fidelity and not repeat the mistakes we had in COVID. Um, and I think going forward, as we plan for future pandemics, we do need to have people who are expert in allocation, and that's at the moment, unfortunately, too few, to be at the table to help guide policymakers so that they can have the information readily available that has been concluded by extensive work uh, in this issue already. Thank you very much. Look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, uh, Zeke, for that incredible tour de force. So we have um, two um, standing mics and then two other roving mics. So you can either come up to the mics to ask a question uh, or you can put up your hand and uh, one of the assistants will bring a mic to you. So we have uh, sort of half an hour for questions where you can ask Zeke anything about 
the talks or indeed anything about medical ethics, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer. Questions? Uh, thanks, Zeke, for the talk. Really enjoyed it. Can you tell me who you are just so I have a... Um, I'm Worley. I'm a research fellow at the Center for Biomedical Ethics. Um, so I enjoyed the talk, and, but I got the, pick, the impression, right? I'm not sure whether that's what you really think, that um, on your view, um, allocating uh, vaccines or treatments to those who contributed to its development is purely a matter of reciprocity and no other value. But um, there are incentive effects to, for instance, um, co rewarding or at least um, allocating more, giving priority to those who contributed because um, that encourages them to produce more in the future and this alleviates the supply problem, right? As well as, of course, there's a reciprocity, the value of reciprocity, and a matter of respecting people as uh, moral agents, right? Uh, because if we ignore people's capacity as producers to um, uh, ignore the fact that they did produce something and exercise their capacity to reason to do that, um, we, f we, f we treat them as mere means to an end rather than as a moral agents in and of themselves. So there are, in fact, um, a number of different values um, that um, count in favor of actually uh, prioritizing uh, producers or people who contribute to the production of a vaccine, right? And so, or at least what is your uh, thought on actually um, having... You, um, you, you mean the CEO of Pfizer should be first in line? <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's what it sounds like you're arguing. Well, not, well, not necessarily the CEO of Pfizer, but at least countries which do. Contribute. I mean, he, he, he made the decision to spend a billion dollars to develop the vaccine and to partner with BioNTech. He made that decision. No one else in the company. If you're talking about people who should be incentivized, I presume that he would be first in line. Why not? Well, I, I don't <laughs> agree with that. Uh, he has lots of incentives outside of. Uh, um, being first in line for the vaccine. Um, and I don't think uh, those people, you're right, we have to consider uh, a priority uh, setting, um, or we have to consider some incentive structure, but I think that there are lots of other incentives that will take care of that, and we don't need uh, reciprocity. And I don't think he's done enough, uh, certainly compared to the risk other people face. I think reciprocity is there in general to break ties and not uh, to reward people. So for example, if you imagine um, people uh, who participate in a clinical research trial um, that they might be prioritized for a vaccine. Uh, you know, if they, if they were in a trial for uh, an antiviral. I just don't uh, see that as a good justification uh, they might not be at high risk, um, and I'm not sure that I would, uh, uh, unless there were some, somehow you had two 75-year-olds in one dose kind of situation. Right. Okay, we should, we should keep going. We've got some other questions. Um, yeah, gentlemen. thank you. I'm uh, Peter Piot, and I'm a visiting professor here at NUS and uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and special advisor to the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, including... COVID and I, and I was confronted with this kind of choices and thanks so much for the presentation because I, you know, it does give indeed a framework for how to tackle that in a more rational base than, uh, you know, last minute type of discussions and so uh, certainly um, uh, my main message that I will bring home is that we need to involve uh, people like you, I mean, and every country has them in, in our discussions. Now, one thing that uh, we were confronted with, of course, is that for vaccines, this scarcity. Scarcity is always an enemy of equity. And, that's, and so the, uh, I'd like to, to put on the table the allocation or access among nations, among countries, which is a bit of a different issue than within a, a particular nation. And here, politics come in, in a sense that uh, referring to um, you mentioned COVAX, and the strategy of COVAX to provide vaccines, particularly to Sub-Saharan Africa, was to um, rely on Indian manufacturers. 
And then in India was hit by a, a very big a COVID epidemic and Prime Minister Modi decided to ban export of um, vaccines. And then there was a lot of talk about vaccine nationalism and so on and so on. And so the question I have to get some ethical guidance and perspective on the following problem. Uh, in democratic countries, at least, the president or prime minister is elected by their own citizens, not by citizens far away. And so is, what are the ethics of saying, I will make, do everything I can to, make, to get the vaccines for my people? And this is not about ultra-nationalism or so on, but just a matter of accountability. But that's well, something well, I've been struggling with. Um, we've written about it. Yeah? <laughs> uh, yes. I, I know, but I asked, uh, uh, I'd like to hear. It's very uh, practical, uh, at the practical First level. of all, let, let me just say it's, it's an incredibly difficult problem, but yeah. it is not an insoluble problem. Because you have two values here. As you point out, uh, uh, national, some nationalism is legitimate because democratic officials are elected by their country. Unless we have world government, which we don't have and are not likely to get, the best way we can uh, promote the well-being of individuals is to have governments of their country promote their well-being. So a leader, especially a leader of a democratic country, has a legitimate claim that he or she needs to protect his or her own citizens. That's the first order of business. But importantly, that is not unlimited. It's not, I can nationalize all the vaccines for my country. So you have to evaluate uh, uh, the global impact on others uh, and balance it out, uh, uh, your nationalization. You can prioritize your citizens, but not to the exclusion of the country. And that balancing, we've given a more subtle analysis of it, uh, uh, limits how much you can keep. And it limits it more than you would think uh, uh, on ethical grounds. Um, I will say that you know, there are lots of attacks, uh, attack on vaccine nationalism directed at Britain and the United States. Not a lot of attacks on India because India is not a rich country, it's a middle income country. And yet the vaccine nationalism was more and you might say more harmful from India than from other uh, uh, countries. Uh, it obviously does uh, secondly address how we think about preparing for the next pandemic. Yep. Clearly relying on one country and only one country for production is a mistake. It makes it hard to implement ethical values with fidelity. And so we need to think about uh, uh, dispersing uh, production facilities. By the way, flu is the same thing. There are, I believe, only nine countries or maybe 11 countries that pr produce flu vaccine. That is going to create the same kind of problem if we have a flu pandemic. Um, and we've got to better plan now so that we can be ethical later. There will always be shortage. You're 100 mm. percent right. But there can be less severe shortage and maybe not the kind of vaccine nationalism that we did see uh, uh, in this. Again, some vaccine nationalism is legitimate. Some, but not, it's less than 50% uh, uh, retained. And, uh, but you also need a international distribution that's ethical. And one of the problems of COVAX is their international distribution was not yeah. ethically guided. You know, I had told them that they shouldn't go down the path of population. We were alerted at the WHO, very, the ethicists at the, who were working with the WHO, very late in the process before they were going out with their population distribution, literally days ahead. Just a mistake. Yeah, I also told them, but it didn't work. But yeah. just, and it's because of that, I, I totally agree with the, um, you know, when we see problems like that, we need to think for the next time. And that's why, for example, at the EU, we've allocated over a billion euro to support vaccine manufacturing in sub-Saharan Africa. So because that will then reduce the problem, not well, eliminate it. Well, well, I agree with you, it'll reduce the problem, it won't eliminate it, and then you're gonna have a problem within Africa, which countries yeah. get it. Okay, we should move, John, I think you next. Uh, Zeke, thanks very much. Uh, John Wong from uh, Singapore. Um, can you comment about um, ethics of drug pricing? Uh, 
vaccines and then in your former discipline of, say, oncology? What do you, uh, I mean, look, uh, one of the big issues is uh, uh, in considering drug pricing, you need to consider the issue of sustainable uh, future development. Uh, and here's where incentives really do matter, right? Companies have to get a return. And, and this, is, this was very much true in COVID, right? Why should I get involved in COVID, spend money, spend critical resources when I could do something totally different and make more money at it? Um, so we do have to appreciate that we want the drug companies to get involved um, and not sit on the sidelines during a health emergency. Um, that doesn't allow highway robbery. And I think one of the problems is uh, we have had too much highway robbery going forward. Um, I'm a big advocate. I think an intuitive principle uh, behind uh, uh, drug pricing and it is okay. Uh, the more health benefits you get from a drug, the higher the price ought to be. Um, I think most people agree with that uh, kind of principle. Uh, it does push you towards a uh, cost effectiveness uh, a ranking of pricing, um, drawing a threshold uh, to what the cost effectiveness threshold should be is hard, but it's not impossible. And one of the things I think we do in healthcare is we often think, well, we're the only game in town. There are lots of other places. We, uh, I think Julian accurately said, we make allocation decisions if only implicitly all the time. Um, you know, in healthcare, we're talking about 50,000, 100,000, 150,000 is the cost effectiveness threshold. And you and I are oncologists, you know, the oncology uh, manufacturers, they want to talk about $250,000 per quality adjusted life year. It's an absurd number. When you actually empirically look at what people are willing to spend, um, uh, the cost of the, the York Center on Health Economics, I believe, did analysis, you know, actually it's lower than the threshold currently used even in places like England or Australia. Um, we should, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 is quite a reasonable, and almost all the current drugs, certainly in the United States, I don't know the exact pricing in Singapore, would be, have their price substantially reduced. I think that's a place to start. Right now, we have you know, gene therapies that people are in the $3 million range. Now, think about this. I don't know the exact numbers for Singapore, but they can't be far off from what I'm about to say regarding the United States. The lifetime earnings of the average person is under $3 million. So you're asking society to pay more than the lifetime earnings to uh, uh, cure an illness or do something. That doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, and I don't see how that can possibly be justified. Um, my name is Dale Fisher. I'm an uh, infectious disease physician with the School of Medicine here. And for the last four years, I was chair of the Global Outbreak Alert Response Network at WHO. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk more about um, implementing ethics, if you like. I think it's uh, no one would disagree with the principles that you've discussed and the relative importance. But you talk about a seat at the table uh, to further these discussions. And globally, of course, there is no seat. WHO can give advice, but you're still going to see at a national level and even a subnational level um, these export limitations that we saw. It obviously wasn't just vaccines, it was PPE and all sorts of things. Uh, you've also said that it's the first order of business to protect your own country, so you can't blame those people for saying we're not letting any of our masks go. So. Um, I'm just wondering, I can see how ethical principles can come out at a national level, but at a global level, I, uh, I struggle to see how this is implementable. In, uh, in outbreak response, obviously, we talk about preparedness and response, and of course, your response is completely dependent on your preparedness. So how do you 
what, what does the preparedness phase of uh, ethics look like um, globally? So the first thing I want to say is I, want, I, I do want to, uh, maybe I wasn't sufficiently clear, and I want to clarify my position. Um, uh, there is a limit, a principled limit to, va to vaccine nationalism. Keeping all for your own is probably not the ethical, not probably, is not the ethical thing to do. Um, you do have global obligations. Uh, you are part of a global community, and that does require uh, uh, participating in it. So, yes, vaccine national is the first order of business, but it's not the only order of business. And I, w I think I was pretty clear about that, and if I wasn't, I am clear about it now. Um, I, um, I am not as uh, pessimistic as you are uh, uh, about uh, the allocation. It is true we don't have a global government, and maybe you would like me to wave a wand and tell you the solution is we have a global government, and that'll solve the problem. Nonetheless, um, I would argue that we have made advances because we have a global set of principles. We have, uh, by and large, a global framework, and we do agree about the weighting of some of these principles. There are some variations, like the Canadian putting first peoples high um, than other countries would. Um, what we have seen is that there was a major failure by Gavi uh, and uh, WHO regarding COVAX um, in that they could have done the ethical thing, but they didn't do the ethical thing. And that undermined, I think, the global collaboration that was, could have been possible and could have established a very good precedent for going forward. We have, you know, whether you or I or anyone, you know, thinks the WHO didn't respond perfectly, we still need something doing their function and trying to get consensus around the world where we can. Um, and I think there's no, uh, each country is going to adapt, but we do need a global response. The fact that we're having some preparedness discussions, we're talking about frameworks regarding IP, does suggest that people recognize we are interdependent in, this, in the next pandemic, and we're going to have to have some better joint responses. And I, I think... Um, there's no foolproof method because we don't have a world government. We have to go along until people, we do have a better functioning international organization and people can agree on both the principles and the way of implementing them during a crisis. Who's going to do it? How is it going to work? Um, I really, uh, you know, there was a great opportunity with COVAX and unfortunately it blew it pretty bad. So maybe I can press you on this question a, a little <laughs> bit more. Um, so, I mean, there was this terrible situation, which I understand, where millions of doses of vaccine were just being destroyed. And I think if you're an American or a Brit, you know, you would rather see vaccines going to, to Africa or, or another part of the world rather than just being destroyed. But I think, I think you had a principle that um, we should retain vaccines for a nation until we've reduced excess mortality. Yes. And, and once we've achieved that point, then we should be distributing them right. to, to other countries. Right. That seems a very plausible ethical principle. But I can see an American saying, no American should die uh, from, from COVID, and we should only distribute vaccines elsewhere once we've saved every possible American life. It's only in cases of, of complete surplus of vaccine. So... The, the, the I, I don't think that's a justifiable well, position. But, no, but, but people are extremely selfish when it comes to their own lives. So I, well, one of the roles of ethics is to counter our selfishness. No, no, but with, I, I, with, I agree with in, you. But the in question personal was, pr principles. But you, you did political philosophy at Harvard. I haven't done political... So I thought the question was... How are you going to implement this in practice when people are going to say, well, how many Americans do you think should die in order to save 1,000, 100,000 um, people in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, so, practically, uh, how are you going uh, to overcome that? In oh, well, if you want me to put on my political science hat and, you know, um, uh, look, one of the problems we're having now of supply chains or 
now it's being slightly relieved, but before it was not slightly relieved, is the fact that the uh, uh, pandemic affected lots of countries um, and we are suffering uh, inflation, lack of uh, goods and uh, other items that we need and we need for our participation in uh, the global economy because those other countries could not uh, actually produce. They had to lock down or uh, they, they had to withdraw from the global economy. So part of what you want is larger than just the protecting your population. Remember, we believe in trade. We believe in uh, participating in the global community. We believe lives of other people are valuable. Um, one of the reasons we go to war when our own country is not threatened um, directly. Um, and so I don't think it's an impossible argument to make or convince people of, especially given the COVID experience and the extreme shortages that we've had. Does it require work? Yes, because you're trying to overcome, as you point out, Julian, selfishness. And it's always hard to overcome selfishness. But I also think it's a good reason to prevent selfishness in lots of other ways. Okay, maybe I could ask you an ethical question then, because that's, that's not really my area. But, <laughs> but you talked about uh, maximizing benefits and minimizing harms. And the way in which benefit was construed through the pandemic was lives saved or li and harms were lives lost. And people who challenged that outcome measure of benefit and harm were, were often roundly pilloried. So in Australia, a, a very unpopular and somebody who I have had no currency with, Tony Abbott, suggested we should measure the harms and benefits in terms of quality adjusted life years. Lord Sumption in the UK suggested we should measure it in terms of life years, which will give greater priority to young people. So in, in, the, in Italy, when this idea of having an age-based cutoff was floated, it was roundly criticised. So, and you mentioned your experience with organ donation. How do you think benefit and harm should be construed? Well, the first thing I would say is, um, it, uh, and I, if, again, if I wasn't clear about it, I am, I'm gonna be now, it has to be evidence-based, and you cannot uh, make a generalization across illnesses. So for example, in COVID, clearly those people who are most at risk are older. And so you're gonna save older people. Uh, you know, as my brother whispered to me uh, over the phones when we were talking about it, he says, aren't you the guy who said people should die at 75 and now you wanna save all those people over 75? Aren't you gonna be consistent, please? No, you wanna save people over 75 because they are at most risk in COVID. But when I argued the distribution of uh, influenza vaccine, yes. If you look at most influenza pandemics, most, you look at the 1918, 1920 pandemic, it's a U-shaped curve. Older people died, but un people under 20 were at highest risk of dying from influenza. And I argued quite clearly that they should get priority. Um, and that in that case, the priority quite clearly should be in children. I have similarly argued for uh, younger people and life years uh, uh, for organ donation. And the reason is younger people have, are deprived of, uh, or have the least of something very important, the least amount of life. A 75-year-old has a chance to live a complete life. A 20-year-old has not had a chance to complete uh, uh, live a complete life, and they should, when they are the most at risk, get priority. Let me just tell you a story about that. After I wrote the article with, um, it's probably not famous in Singapore, but in the United States it was infamous because the Wall Street Journal published it on its op-ed page. I had a whale-shaped graph for who gets priority for organ donation and younger ages get, and then it progressively goes down. Um, and I've done this test hundreds uh, of times with thousands of people, put up three people and say each of them needs a liver, who gets priority, the three-year-old, the 20-year-old, or the 70-year-old, and you can describe them however you want. Um, and when I went to China uh, with, uh, and gave a presentation on allocation using this, uh, my sort of uh, uh, host said, oh, no, no, this is in China, we respect old people, 
they will get priority. And I said, well, let's find out. I won that bet. Um, uh, and I've never lost the bet. There will be one or two people who might say the 70-year-old. 80 to 90% of people say the 20-year-old and the remaining say the three-year-old. It is consistent across every country I've done it in, and I've done it in about uh, five continents. Um, and life years do matter to people. Um, and when I was pilloried again about this, one of the, I was on a call-in show, and you had a lot of people calling in who were older who said, you know, I would easily give up my chance to get an organ for my grandchild or to get a vaccine in influenza for my grandchild. So people do understand that age may make a difference. Now, if the older people are at higher risk, they should get priority. But in general, if everyone's at equal risk, younger people and life years count. Um, but you have to look at the data for any particular case. COVID is not gonna be influenza, influenza is gonna be different. This is why I do think, to get to the question of Peter Piat, this is why you have to have ethicists at the table who can look at the data and say what the data mean for the ethical judgments. We can have the values, we can have the ethical framework, but mixing the two, what do the data say about risks and benefits with the principles, does require some sophistication and you can't trust policymakers all the time to have that sophistication. Okay, I think um, at that, on that uh, very important note, we should just draw the events to a close. I think, you know, one of the things that um, I've learned in the last 30 years is ethics is inescapable. You have to decide how you're going to allocate your resources and to choose to do nothing is to make an ethical decision. You know, the idea that we can just leave it to first come, first served means that more people will die, uh, lead worse quality lives and so on. So first of all, ethics has, we have to make ethical decisions. And secondly, we can make them better or worse. And you know, there are, the sign of a good ethical talk is not that you go out with enlightenment, um, that you suddenly, you know, you know the truth and you can go off and, and do the right thing. The sign of a good ethical talk is that you're thinking about things. It stimulated you to think for yourself. And th there are many things I agreed with Zeke uh, on in his talk. There were some things I disagreed with. Um, that's inevitable. And what the sign of a good ethics talk is it enables you to then make your decision about how to allocate resources or how to um, distribute benefits and burdens. So I think this has been a fantastic example, of firstly, of the inescapability of ethics, and secondly, how you can think in a principled way that it also enables you to think more and more. As he, uh, you know, as he went through those, those different diagrams of, of monkeypox and cholera, it's like, wow, it gets richer and richer and more and more difficult. And, and that's not to say that he's, he's got to the right answer. He's got to an answer that can be defended, and that's all we can hope for. And I completely support his call for involvement of, of people with professional ethics experience and training in these decisions, not so that they can make the decisions, but so they can help the regulatory bodies or the committees to think more deeply about these existential issues that in the end we have to decide. So thank you for a fantastic example to, to set off this thank lecture you. series.